Hello, today's episode of the Engage Brain Podcast is sponsored by Runner's Wheel. Have you ever been out on a run and lost track of time, where you've entered a rhythm so steady, so perfect, that you ignore anything and everything? Have you found that you go faster during these states? Any run without the sense of time is better than those runs on the treadmill or runs where you check your watch every two seconds, only to be reminded that you have miles upon miles upon miles to go. Well, worry no more. With the runner's wheel, you'll never know what time uh, or your pace. The runner's wheel is a watch that trains you to your pace rather than you being a slave to the electronic manacle on your wrist that drags down your effort, your pace, and your enthusiasm. By giving you false and unreliable feedback, the runner's wheel only gives you your true time and pace at the end of your run, so that you can run by feel. The runner's wheel is only to be used in conjunction with routes that you can run continuously for your entire run. Otherwise, you can try to figure out your pace, and we don't want you figuring out your pace uh, until the very end. So break free from your times and your brain's subjective effort and reach your true potential. The runner's wheel. Most of the time, the brain's governor on our abilities is a good thing. It stops us from injuring ourselves and others. But sometimes we just want to take that governor off and just go, especially if the governor is set at a fairly conservative level. Many events in running push various physiological processes to the extreme. In the 400 and 800, you're trying to push through the lactic acid production uh, and finish uh, under in the 400 under that uh, lactic acid threshold, and in the 800, you're uh, fighting for about 400 meters uh, while at lactic acid production is in full bore. Uh, and in the marathon, uh, you're pushing your carbohydrate stores all the way down to their bare minimum and well under them uh, if you're not replacing them at all. Uh, so today I'll speak with Dylan Geringer about how we can take findings from neuroscience to try to trick our brain and improve our running performance. All right, I'm here with uh, Dylan Geringer, and we're talking about my favorite topic, uh, neuroscience, but also my second favorite topic, maybe my first favorite topic, running. Uh, so well, what got you interested in, in running? Well, I run for the college here, and I mean, I run 80 miles a week, and that's pretty much all I think about when I'm not running, too, so it just made sense to incorporate running into my neuroscience project. Yeah, and I gave uh, statistics for uh, uh, Spencer. Uh, He's on the baseball team, and his topic is on baseball, so uh, do you have any running statistics you'd like to throw out? What do you mean? So, like, uh, PRs or or accomplishments? Um, I'm about a 15, 35K guy, 4, 18 miler. That's pretty much what I focus on. Cross country, 8K, like 25, 58. All right. That range. Yeah, so many minutes faster than anything I can run (laughs) at those distances. Uh, But what have been some interesting findings applying neuroscience to running? Um, I found a lot of interesting things. One that really struck me was... There were rats who had been introduced to cocaine and they were looking for like replacements for cocaine to like have them not be dependent on it. And one of the things that worked was having them run on a wheel. So like wheels, wheel running can be like a dependence replacer for a drug for at least rats. So would you say that all runners running 80 miles a week are addicted to running? Uh, Yeah, I would say the endorphins can probably be pretty addicting. <laughs> I've also seen that going the other way, that uh, a lot of ultramarathoners are like recovering opiate a- addicts. I, I've read that too, like in various like ultra running magazines and such, because like they need something else to fill the, the fix that they had. Yeah, and there's not too many things that you can do that can t- take up hours of your day, <laughs> uh, like running 50 miles. Uh, how about, what, has there been some other interesting findings with uh, running? Um, yeah. Uh, another thing that was really interesting was marathoners were tested, and half were, like, they were randomly assigned. Half were given a placebo, and half were given a carbohydrate drink. And they were checked every 3.2 kilometers of the marathon. And the ones who were just given a placebo were showing that their exertion was much higher because they were less nourished than the ones who were given the carbohydrate drink. 
but yet at the end of the race they still showed the same level of perceived exertion despite the fact that they had obviously exerted themselves harder to run the marathon because they'd given been given a placebo hmm. so is that kind of like a mind over body yeah yeah like running is very much dependent on your brain and what you think you're doing yeah as much as it is physically I, I know i'm gonna jump um competitions now but uh do you remember, or have you ever seen the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest? Yes, I okay. love that. Yeah, and uh, what's his name from Japan? Kobayashi. Uh, Kobayashi. Uh, that uh, when he first came in the uh, competition, the record at the time was 25 hot dogs in 12 minutes. And I think he came in and had like 49 or, or something yeah. like that. And I, I think that lesson applied to running uh, just shows like how um, like there's this kind of I don't know, community line or demarcation. Uh, say it's a world record and uh, people who can just like jump past that kind of Mm -hmm. going past those physical limitations it's sort of like when the four minute barrier was like a huge thing and the banister broke it and then a couple years later everyone was able to like break this unbreakable barrier yeah because like it was very much a mental thing and that plays into another thing that i talk about which is uh, a research article is the brain good at marathoning and like the answer is like sort of no because like there's an exhaustion point where you just like can't do anything anymore but the brain is like very dedicated to shutting you down before you get to that point because obviously like it's like about preserving the health of the body so they like look at uh like methods to like train how you can like push a little bit further Mm -hmm. before your brain decides like we're too close to exhaustion Mm -hmm. and that's like really interesting research that is like still being developed now yeah yeah so i come from this kind of a sprinting background and the cutoff there is like the switch from like how much can you burn up in terms of like readily available uh sugars for like sprint and they basically put it at 45 seconds so the 400 is basically how how close can you get to that 45 second before you uh like exhaust your um short burst muscles and I think that's also what makes the 800 so interesting because mm-hmm. the 800s generally ran as like a 400 sprint and then can you, can you hold on without dying? Yeah. Like that's what the 800 is. And I, I'd like to go into more research on like the neuroscience of the 800. It'd be more narrow, but like mm-hmm. I think it'd be really interesting because it's like widely considered the hardest event like mentally because of the different systems and just trying to like prevent yourself from reaching exhaustion yeah it's like the physiological barriers um that are then modified by the psychological barriers right do you think the two-hour marathon is uh, the uh, kind of like at the point the four minute mile was in the um the four minute mile like I, i hope so but like just like the four minute mile looking at it now people i mean hitchamaru ran 343 mm-hmm. like i can't imagine anyone ever doing the equivalent of that in a marathon if someone breaks two hours like i don't think it'll ever go much below two hours okay just because of the physiological requirements of that but i mean it'll be really interesting to see how that affects runners mentally Mm -hmm. too because maybe yeah so the i saw an i've seen a couple articles about the two hour marathon and uh, they've been uh, a lot of them have been about the like ideal conditions so what sort of race, what sort of temperature, so it's like a, you know, flat race uh, with very few 90 degree turns uh, with about 40 degree temperature. Uh, And then the second part of the requirements were all like mental. Uh, So it needed to be like a pack of uh, guys all with the capability of running two hours. And Uh, another part about the mental is they also are like saying that you offer like a big enough prize yeah. and then you'll get all these runners together and between the prize money and the wanting to beat all the other best runners in the world that'll give them the mental push to go for two hours yeah and then the last one was that they were going to um alter the like watches slash time uh, keeping things so that uh it like their pace um uh, what was it it's like basically tricking them into thinking they're uh, running a, a different pace Oh, so they think they're running slower, so they need to pick it up pick to it keep up, up to yeah. with what they want to run. Oh, that's, that's smart. Yeah, and so I can't, there's a... I think that goes in with the perceived exertion thing, too, mm-hmm. because if you think you're running slower and you know you can run faster, like, you'll perceive your exertion to be less, and that'll trick your brain a little bit into yeah. 
delaying the exhaustion point. Yeah, but I also think that that prize money one is interesting. Uh, so a couple of years ago, the I think United Arab Emirates uh, started a marathon. It's in like January or some February or something like that. No one ran it before, and then all of a sudden the prize money for it is like in the millions, uh, and all the top marathoners go there running, you know, sub 210 uh, in like 80 degree heat. I mean, money is a huge motivator mm -hmm. in running because especially marathoners, you can only get really like two good marathons a year. Yeah. So it's hard to make the money that they need to live. So that kind of motivation will really push, push them to show up. Yeah. yeah. And, and have you seen anything else within the kind of the physiology of running uh, and neuroscience? Um, yeah, uh, running can have a, like they tested marathoners directly after a mm -hmm. marathon. And I want to get this right. They have better implicit, their implicit memory improves while their explicit memory is uh, impaired a little bit post-marathon. And they have cognitive tasks to measure this, which I guess makes, like, I was having a hard time understanding the reasoning behind it. There was a lot of, like, jargon. Okay. In, but I believe it's that you've been, like, doing... You've been running, which is very implicit. Right. So you're, like, sharpening your implicit skills throughout the marathon. Yeah. And, like, something else, like... I'm sure if they had so something else to do with their legs, their legs would be too tired for their implicit functions to be improved. Yeah. But, like, just, like, they've been honed over the course of the marathon. Yeah. But... The mental fatigue also takes away from the explicit memory, I would assume. Yeah, uh, I, from a personal experience <laughs> running one marathon, uh, afterwards I was just in a daze. Uh, like, I barely remember crossing the finish line and the, I don't know, half mile long walk through the, like, recovery zone. Uh, yeah, it was just, like, completely gone. So I, I can definitely report the lack of explicit memory. Yeah. And maybe some parts of the marathon I don't want to remember anyways. Um, but uh, do you think uh, going forward with, uh, like, can neuroscience help uh, improve running? Uh, like, will we see coaches starting to improve I mean, neuroscience? Alberto Salazar already works very, very closely with neuroscience. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest improvement that neuroscience will bring is training your brain to delay the exhaustion point. But also, like, uh, Alberto Salazar works more with like the confidence thing like uh he had one of his runners shannon roberry mm -hmm. wear bright pink lipstick to match her uh spikes. spikes and then she ran a pr because it's the whole like confidence get confidence in your head like look good run good yeah like i mean i'd say that's definitely neuroscience related it's confidence like mm -hmm. making your brain think you're like just more confident yeah, so do you think this all has to kind of come from an outside uh, source, so like a coach uh, applying these tricks onto someone? Because I feel like having knowledge of like, oh, I'm tricking my brain into doing something doesn't really help me. You know, like sometimes, uh, I don't know if, if Tom does this for um, training, uh, but you have like a posted workout, and then uh, just as you think that you're finished, uh, you have to do like one more rep uh, that you're not expecting. Yeah, I that's always interesting because like if your like body and mind has time to prepare for something yeah like it's easier uh tom executes that well where he'd had us do a tempo and it was like a six mile tempo really hard and then we get back and he's like whoa don't go cool down yet you have some 200s to do yeah and like it's a lot about like if your mind is expecting something, you won't get as many benefits out of it mm -hmm. because, like, it has time to prepare in your body. So, yeah. like, he uses that already. And, like, a lot of things that coaches do, they probably honestly don't realize, but they are connected to neuroscience yeah. and, like, training it that way. And another thing that people have been tampering with is a lot of marathoners will sit at a computer screen with this program for, like, hours at a time and ultra marathoners. And it's just, like, this really mindless task where you just have to focus and you have to click on boxes and stuff. Uh -huh. And, like, that trains you to stay focused for the marathon. Okay. So it's, like, about that attention span because, I mean, if you're going to be out there for, I mean, the top guys, two hours and five minutes, like, that's a long time to, like, have a sharp mind. Yeah. So they're using, like, neuroscience techniques to train your mind that way for focus, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be really helpful for, uh, like, trail marathoners. Uh, I'm running a... 
half a marathon on the trails this summer and the last time I ran one last summer it was just exhausting uh, like seven miles in you're watching every one of your steps you can't fall into any sort of pattern yeah you have you have to focus on the trail because you never know when your foot's going to catch a group or yeah like it really like keeps you sharp yeah I, I would like a marathon like that or a half marathon like that because I feel like it would keep me more engaged than just like pounding straight down a road yeah yeah and uh, I, I would suggest never running a half marathon in uh, any place that keeps track in kilometers uh, because <laughs> uh, you're reminded so much more often like what your pace is I ran one in Canada last year, and yeah, 21 times uh, I was able to like keep track. Like, oh, I know I want to be at three. I don't know, it was like 3:55 or something like that. And it was just so easy to keep track of the Ks. That's rough too. Yeah, I I almost don't like I don't wear watches or anything when I run because uh, yeah. I feel like I I'm big on running by feel and like how I feel and listening to my body mm-hmm. and, and mind. So I don't wear watches because I feel like the watch dictates the pace then. Yeah. And that's like also one of my favorite races is my hometown run for the Diamonds, which is like a huge race. You win Diamonds, like former Olympians have won it. Okay. Um, and they only provide a split for the first mile and then you're by yourself for the rest of the time unless yeah. you have a watch, which okay. I love. Because then you're just like, you're actually racing. Yeah. You're not racing the clock, you're racing each other. And yeah. I really like that. Uh, Bryn Mawr Running Company does a prediction run, I think every month. Uh, where uh, you uh, predict uh, to the second how fast you think you'll run five, seven, or nine or eleven miles, and then everyone takes their watches off, like put put it in a bin, and you go off. Oh, that's cool. And the person who gets the closest to their prediction uh, gets the, the wins the race. It's hmm. interesting. Yeah. So you'll, if you're around for the summer, you'll have to uh, check out there. I think on like Wednesday nights or something like that. I mean, I don't live. So. Yeah, <laughs> I, and the I think they do one at every location, uh, so uh, I think that those are those are interesting. Let's see what other questions are. Do you, so going forward, do you think that uh, there will be seeing more neuroscience uh, at the top levels? Yeah, I think uh, once again Alberto Salazar, he's the coach of the Nike Oregon Project. Mm-hmm. He is very much about getting every ounce of anything out of his athletes, and he's really paving the way for neuroscience and running. He brings in a lot of like doctors like neurologists like psychi like everybody that he can to get the most out of his runners and i mm-hmm. think like it really does take one person to go out and start doing something yeah. and then if it works for them right everyone wants in the bandwagon so i really think that there's a big future for neuroscience and running especially because like a lot of people will say like oh running is like 75 to like 90 percent mental like yeah i mean that's where neuroscience can really help yeah so it might almost be like a, a tracking um, device too. So like uh, tracking meaning like uh, if you don't have like the mental, I don't know, fortitude say to run the longer distances, we have to you know kind of shift you down mm-hmm. uh, and maybe train you at this distance. Definitely. I mean, like just mentally, not everyone has it in them to run a marathon. Mm-hmm. Like that's just the reality of it. A marathon is a long, grueling race, and if you don't have the mental capacity, no matter what your physical like level is like you just won't be able to cut it yeah yeah and then maybe even looking at kind of training methods i think that the kind of addictiveness that you we were talking you were talking about earlier with opioids and how running can kind of replace opioids and running being a kind of an addictive thing for uh, runners how can we uh, look at that more closely to understand training and uh, maybe more appropriate training i think it definitely plays a huge part in training too because it just I just realized now as we were talking, like one thing Tom had us do last year was he had us take a day off, mm-hmm. but he told us to write 10 miles in our logs anyway, okay. because a lot of us are very much like, for us to have the confidence, we need to see like, for me, it's like I need to see a number that starts with eight in my log for total yeah. mileage for the week. Yeah. So like if I just taken a day off and written a zero, like that would have very much messed with my brain. Like yeah. I would, wouldn't have the confidence. I wouldn't have, like it just wouldn't be there. Yeah. But running zero miles and writing 10 like it didn't even feel like a day off Mm -hmm. especially because it didn't say it in the log and like that's huge it's amazing how like what you write down matters almost as much as what you actually did as far as confidence goes yeah i've also seen it go the other way so i don't know yesterday i I did not feel like running at all and i just went out and ran uh, down college to uh, the preserve Uh, i don't know if those woods out there if Mm -hmm. you ever run on those trails yeah and i just 
got down those trails and then just kept running and you know like went I don't know 65 minutes or something like that and running uh, around those trails uh, it felt so much better yeah felt so much better after like not feeling it at all uh, so it's kind of fun to see it go both ways I mean I think getting out of the door is the hardest part of yeah. running yeah uh, well, I don't think I have too much else. Uh, so, kind of wrapping up, uh, do you think that there's any uh, really important thing that you want to uh, talk about in terms of neuroscience and run? Just that, like, I I'm predicting that it's going to to be huge. I think neuroscience is going to put, like, especially if someone is going to break the the two hour barrier in the marathon, for example. Like, neuroscience is going to play a part in, in training them. Mm-hmm. Like, I bet you whoever breaks it has someone working with them on that. Yeah. Uh, okay, right. so then uh, we'll wrap up uh, here. So anything you'd like to promote? Um, follow my Twitter. It's at D. Garinger, and I tweet funny things. All right. <laughs> uh, so we'll ta- I'll link that uh, on the little write-up. Uh, but thank you so much for coming in, and good luck tonight. Thank you. It's just kind of crazy. People these days, they fail to understand that I'm riding on a storm with the mic in my hand. With the mic in your hand? Yes, the mic in my hand. I'm riding on a storm with the mic in my hand. People these days, they fail to understand. So thanks so much to Dylan for coming in and talking about my favorite topic, running, running in the brain. Uh, It's so great to hear about uh, another person who's interested in in, in running in the brain. And such an interesting topics uh how the brain limits us in what uh, we can do and how we can try to get around those limitations by kind of tricking the brain uh in different ways uh, so those placebos versus uh actual carbohydrates uh, and looking at the perception of how tired we are uh versus trying to see how we can trick the brain into um other exertion or effort or how fast we're going or what time we're going uh, so uh, trying to use the, our understanding of the brain and neuroscience to kind of sneak around uh, the limitations and the barriers that the brain might put on us uh, in order for us to, I guess, not damage it. Uh, so maybe a good thing, but at times uh, we can try to uh, move around those barriers. Uh, so uh, what an interesting conversation. I'm looking forward to another conversation about uh, running in the brain uh, in another upcoming episode of the podcast. Uh, that uh, episode uh, will be with uh, Katie Rose Sullivan uh, talking about how uh, running can sometimes induce a, a feeling of um, happiness or joy, uh, kind of t- called the runner's high, and how there might be a couple of different uh, chemical explanations for how that's actually occurring. Uh, so turning to the last uh, bits of the show, uh, we'll look first to uh, Jake's Jams, uh, the part of the show where I talk about things that I enjoy or things that I find interesting and just want to share with you, uh, see if it's something that you'd be interesting, interested in. Uh, so uh, since we just talked about uh, running in the brain, I thought I'd talk about Saucony. Uh, I don't know if I've talked about it before, probably have. Uh, it's um, the brand of shoes that I really enjoy wearing. Uh, from the Saucony uh, Kinvara uh, to the Saucony Verata. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, there's an, another Saucony Trail version of, of those shoes that I've uh, enjoyed wearing. Uh, so uh, Saucony has been a great uh, shoe brand and something that I'll probably stick uh, very close to. I, I have also tried on uh, some New Balance, so I'll, I'll, I'll give another Jake Jam to New Balance. Uh, but uh, uh, both of those brands are kind of a little bit outside of maybe the, the norm, uh, but uh, ones that I very much enjoy. Uh, so uh, now recommending Saucony running shoes uh, for anyone uh, interested in getting into running. Uh, turning to uh, another segment in the show, Scholar Notifications. Uh, a few months, maybe a month and a half ago, uh, a notification popped up in my Google Scholar uh, from uh, a friend of mine uh, and a uh, gra- <coughs> fellow graduate student, uh, graduate from the University of Iowa Neuroscience Program, uh, Matt Sutterer, uh, along with uh, another friend of mine, Joel Bruss, uh, and researchers Aaron B- Bowes, Michelle Voss, uh, who was on my dissertation committee, and Antoine Bashara, and Dan Trinnell, uh, also on my dissertation committee. Uh, they reported in uh, the journal Cortex, um, Cancelled Connections, uh, great title, Cancelled Connections, Lesion-Derived Network Mapping Helps Explain Differences in Performance on Complex Decision-Making Task. Uh, and so in this task, or in the study, they asked um, patients... Uh, to uh, er, the, in the novel approach where they use lesion-derived network mapping 
uh, to use healthy uh, subject resting state functional connectivity data to infer the areas that would be connected with each patient's lesion area in healthy adults. And so they use that approach to investigate whether there was a sy systematic pattern of connectivity associated with decision-making performance in patients with focal damage in areas not classically associated with uh, decision-making. Uh, so these p patients were categorized a priori into impaired and unimpaired uh, groups based on their performance in the Iowa gambling task. Uh, and lesion-derived network maps based on the impaired patients showed overlap in the somatosensory, motor, and insula cortices to a greater extent than the patients who showed unimpaired IGT performance. Uh, so this is akin to the classic concept of diaschesis, uh, that uh, this focus on the remote effects of focal damage can have on large-scale distributed brain networks uh, has the potential to inform not only differences in decision-making behavior, but also other cognitive functions or neurological syndromes where a distinct phenotype has eluded neuroanatomical classification and brain uh, relationships uh, are appear highly heterogeneous. Uh, so what an amazing combination of lesion methods and uh, functional imaging methods uh, in a really interesting study that uh, looks to potentially have a great impact outside of not only uh, neuropsychology and decision-making, uh, but on other uh, types of con cognitive functions where there seems to uh, be no single distinct uh, neurological uh, system. And so uh, great title, cancel connections, great research uh, using these complementary methodology, uh, and uh, what a great report. So uh, again, uh, that's canceled connections. Lesion-derived network mapping helps explain differences in performance on a complex decision-making task uh, from uh, my friend Matt Sutterer uh, and colleagues in the journal Cortex uh, this uh, uh, May 2016. Uh, and so turning to the last uh, episode, or not episode, last segment of the show, rather, uh, the reader mail or Twitter tweets, uh, you can reach me at Engage Brain on Twitter, and you can find the podcast on YouTube, uh, Engage Brain Podcast. And in conjunction with that, you can now reach me at Engage Brain Podcast at gmail.com with any questions or comments. Uh, so far, no questions or comments. Uh, so this might be a segment of the show that goes on the chopping block at some point uh, if no one's out there listening. Uh, so uh, if you are, thank you so much. Uh, this has been the Engage Brain Podcast. Thanks for listening. People these days, they fail to understand because their minds are too small and delusions too grand. Off center cost rendered lost tender bitter call Dr. Mindbender As I strum on my fender Torn between shredder or splinter Summer or winter Fat man grubbing or thinner Losing weight but still not a winner